Hello and welcome back to Dicebreaker, where today we played Blood on the Clock Tower. We had the lovely people in today from the Pandemonium Institute mm -hmm. um, and they ran the game for us. It's a game similar to Werewolf, but turned up to 11 pretty much. It's like they, it's like they, they took all of those elements from like games like Werewolf and The Resistance and Secret Hitler and all, all of those like games where they, they share that sort of core dynamic where it's like, okay, one person gets sort of killed every time or yeah. outvoted or whatever. But it's just been completely turned on its head. It's, it's almost like a weird like mod of a video game where they decided, I know this is completely lost <laughs> me, but it's almost like they decided that like they've been playing Werewolf for so long that they wanted like the, the experts version. Next almost. level. Exactly. Yeah. And it, it, like it was weird, but amazing. Like it was genuinely really, really cool. Yeah. It was, I mean, I've played it a couple of times. So, um, and for me, it was kind of weird because the first maybe one or two times I played it, I wasn't sure about it. Um, mostly because the very first game I ever had was a bit of a mess up. We essentially killed like the two main characters like in the first two killings. <laughs> so it was like a 10 minute game and it was a bit like, oh, okay. Um, and so even when I played the, the, the game straight afterwards, I was, you know, that was still in my head and mm. I wasn't sure. So I'm kind of intrigued to hear how you felt about it since it was your first yes. game of it. And okay, so, so let's let's explain the rules. So so essentially, like if you watched us play Werewolf or if you've played Werewolf yourself, you'll be familiar with how it works, right? So yes. you've got a group of people who are all given a hidden role, and that role will either be blue or red, unless you're playing like some special version. Because there's other like scenarios. Yeah. We played the most basic one. So there's the blue guys who are the, are the good guys and they're in the majority. And then the red are like the demon and its minions. Yes. Uh, so the goal of the game for the demon is to survive until they have the majority. Two players left, yeah. yeah so they've, they've killed everyone but themselves, essentially. Um, and then the goal of the good guys is to try and kill the demon before the game ends. Yes. Uh, the way that they do that is by every single daytime, uh, every sort of villager has a chance to accuse someone of being evil so that they can essentially be executed. Mm -hmm. And if they're executed and they were the imp or whichever demon you're playing with, then good job, you won. And then that's your sort of main interaction as the villager. And then every night, the bad guys are going to pick someone to off. Yes. But the weird thing about Blood on the Clock Tower <laughs> is that whereas in villagers you might, oh, sorry, whereas in Werewolf you might have like eight villagers, one special good role, one... Uh, normal werewolf and then two special bad werewolves or whatever. It's like every single character in the game has a completely different special power or yeah. special rule that they have to follow, including the fact that there's like a third like tier of people called the outsiders yes. who don't necessarily help but hinder and yet are still good. Yeah, so they're part of the good team, mm. but they are like, they've got these like, crappy abilities that, yeah, as you say, kind of hinder, like the drunk mm. that we had in our game, who um, essentially somebody, like, you were the librarian? Um, Let's not spoil it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay, so, so we so we all had roles assigned to us. Yes. Because I'm hoping that the Let's Play does go out. We'll, okay. ha we'll have to check for <laughs> it. But, um, yeah, so we, we were all assigned our, our roles, um, but then the, basically, the as you say, the, the drunk is essentially like this little worm in the back of your head saying, you could be pissed on cider right now. <laughs> because essentially if you get the um, the drunk token, which assigns you that role, you're told by the games master that you're something else, yes. which isn't in play, and yet you aren't. Well, no, you are drunk. that person, but every your abilities malfunction every single time. Yeah. So, for example, if you're the monk in the game who's like, who heal or like saves every night, they um, pick someone to save from the demon, um, and if they were actually drunk, they wouldn't know that they're drunk. Um, and so they're like, think they're saving people, but actually they're not. And mm. so they might figure that out at some point in the game, but they might not. And yeah, so, so, so that, that would be a good example of like, that would be a good example of how for like the monk, if they tried to save someone, they got killed. They'd be like, all right, hold on. Something's gone on here. Yes. Right? But then there's so many different levels of... <laughs> like tomfoolery that yes. can that can interact with each other. Because it was like, okay, look, I think this has happened, but I could be drunk, or one of the bad guys could be the poisoner, in which case they've poisoned me, which is like being drunk, but it happens during the game instead of pre-assigned. Yeah, and but it, then, it changes around. But then also around. this person is interacting with that because they think they're drunk because this person said they were bad <laughs> and now they're good. But it's only because they were the outsider who secretly looks like they're bad but is actually good and it's 
it's like a, a complete web of nonsense going on. I think that you have to unpick. Yeah, I mean, every game I've ever played, throughout the game, you're like, I don't know what's going on because you can't ever know what's mm. going on for sure. And that's kind of part of the joy of the game is that you're like, you think you can figure things out, but at the same time, you, do, you never have all of the information. But like, it's never to the level, because it's not, I don't know what's going on as in, this is just random noise. Yes. It's like, you have all of the pieces there. It's just some of them, are like, like, you flip them over and you realize that it's actually just a cardboard cutout <laughs> of the evidence you thought you had. You know? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. It's like, Oh god, it's 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 really really exciting. Yes. And like we were sat there because as I said, it was the first time we played it. The first time I played it, sorry. And we had a big group of people who hadn't played it before. You were the only person who'd done yes. a game before. And we were all just looking at each other like. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was nonsense. Um, but it was so much fun. It it's, was really good. It's super theatrical as well mm. because you almost have because we were talking to Ben who was running our game for us afterwards, um, and he was saying that with Blood on Clock Tower, it's you you don't just play the referee, yes. like you do in Werewolf, where you're basically just like, all right, close your eyes, Werewolf, open your eyes, it's like someone to kill, which is dull. Yes. You are actually playing yourself, you're keinda of like the dungeon you're, master Yeah, almost. you're like, the storyteller, exactly. so you get involved because at certain points you make decisions. So for example, in a previous game, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, this is actually from a previous game, mm. I, I was the imp in a previous game, and um, I kept trying to kill somebody, um, but there's a role in the game called the mayor, and essentially if you try and kill the mayor as the imp, the storyteller can choose whether or not they're going to let that happen, or they might kill somebody else instead of the mayor, because that's kind of the mayor's special ability, that somebody else might die instead of them. They can so, reflect the threat yeah, almost, or exactly. like someone jumps in front of the gun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that happened to me, and I kept, I kept trying to kill that bloody mayor, and just <laughs> wouldn't die. Um, but obviously as the imp, when that happened, I then knew that they were the mayor because mm. I knew who I'd picked to die and they clearly hadn't died. So, <laughs> so there's like lots of little nuances, nuances that like come into the game and like knowledge is that you can Yeah, but gain. Then, then there's also like these like alternative victory conditions as well. So like the mayor, that's not his only ability. Like if you get to the third round, is it? The third No, wave? it's if there's three, three people left, left alive. Yeah, if there's three people left alive, the mayor can convince everyone to not perform an execution and therefore the good people will win. Yes. Because they've triumphed over evil through diplomacy, I guess. But then yeah. there's also like, there's an outsider character called the saint, where if you ever execute the saint during the day, as in if the villagers turn on the saint, then evil wins because yes. you've killed the best person of all of you almost. So, yeah, like there's, there's also the virgin. So if the virgin dies from execution, mm. um, if they're nominated by another townsperson, the townsperson dies. So it kind of gives you information, again, in that same game that I played previously, somebody had nominated the virgin to die, and then that person instantly died. So we knew, first of all, that that person was definitely the virgin and was a good person, but also that the person who nominated them was definitely good because they wouldn't have died if they'd been an evil player. Yes. So oh my god. <laughs> yeah. So like, it's layer upon layer upon yeah, layer. Yeah, it just, it, it, it is literally, it feels like expert werewolf. It's like if you've played a lot of games of werewolf, and to be fair, like, you, I'm sure you could jump into this without playing werewolf. Yeah. Because, like, werewolf is a pretty simple concept on its own. It's not like a required reading. Yeah, and one of the players today did, had, had she played? Had never played any of it. Yeah, no, I don't so. think so. Um, so, like, it's, it's definitely, and it, it feels weird because, Everything that we're talking about right now as well is just one little module. Yeah. Whereas like every single other module, they're like completely different roles, right? Oh yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. So this this is on Kickstarter right now. Yes. Which is so one thing that's slightly controversial about this game is the price point, which we do have to kind of talk about. Um, so we were just looking at the shipping costs and the game costs on their Kickstarter page, and to ship it to the UK, it's something like a hundred and four dollars, including the price of the game. Yeah. So that's quite an asking. Yeah, for the fact that when you consider what's inside the game, it does seem like a lot, because you kind of get that grimoire thing, yeah. which is the box, which also kind of acts as the book that the storyteller uses to assign the roles and figure out what's going on, essentially. But And then you get the kind of chips that ev is everyone's roles, um, and then I guess you get the sheets, some sheets that mm. like tells you what all the characters are, but other than that, I don't think there's a huge amount of yeah, stuff. Yeah, and it, it feels like quite an expensive price point for something that like, you could print and play. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's, and I, I think, there's, there's two ways of looking at this, I think. There's either the fact that, okay, this is a game that's very expensive, and to be 
completely honest, I didn't think, and this is obviously, it's not the final version of the game. Yeah, I wasn't he did say massively. That, I think, yeah. Sorry? I think he did say that. I think Ben said yeah, that. Yeah, they're definitely, because they, they were talking about like the size of the box changing. Yeah, yeah, stuff. yeah. Um, so I don't know if this is going to change, but I wasn't massively impressed by the graphic design elements of it. I think it's not a particularly pretty game, mm -hmm. especially considering the fact that it's such a high price point. I don't know if the, you know, the sort of level of luxury and the components that will come in the final product will sort of like give reason for how much of that cost is. But yeah. Especially the art that we were playing with today didn't feel great. No, it. Yeah, I I definitely agree with that. It's it's very basic. Mm. Well, it's also it's like cursive font. It feels a bit nineties almost. Right. Which is a weird way of saying it. But like, it, yeah, it feels like a game that's been around for a while and yeah, yeah done a reprint of almost. Yeah. And that's fine, like it's not a game where you're ever looking at the art. You're, no. you're staring at a sheet because it's got all the roles and how they work on it. So you're like, oh, okay, this person's that. What does that mean? Or how does that interact with that? So that's almost just like a little cheat sheet for you when you play yeah. the game. Uh, for the whole of the game, you're just staring at other people. So like, yeah. the art is not incredibly important. No. But, as we said, when that price is so high, it becomes such a, a thing. And I think the second way of looking at it is, it almost feels like you're buying something for like an event. Yeah. For like a big group of people, it's like you all chip in for this one thing because mm. you don't need multiple copies of this game. Right? No. It's almost like something you'd buy if you were at like a board game cafe or something, you know? Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's yeah. got a player count of like five to 20 people, right? And I thought, yeah. I mean, I, I definitely um, appreciate that there's like a, a certain number that you'd want to play with. So, for example, we wanted to have eight people today because that was kind of the number that was given to us. And I was. I was a bit like, why do you not say it's eight to 20 players then, if that's kind of the, yeah. the lowest and you want to play with? We played with seven players. We played with seven, and, and that it, was fine. And it worked fine, like, it was yeah. a very good game. Um, so I don't know what, and I feel I feel like they were they were sort of suggesting that, oh, with five players, you don't really get the true experience. And it's, yes. you know, so what what is actually the minimum player count kind of thing? Yeah. And it's, you know, all those little bits, and especially considering the game's not fully released yet, it's still on Kickstarter. Which, by the way, if you want more information, you can go over to the Kickstarter page, we'll put a link in the description. Yes. Um, but yeah, it's it's a shame, because it, it's an incredibly exciting game. Yeah. And I think it's such a um, such a step up from like the inspiration that it came yeah. from. I also think, um, going back to that kind of, uh, when you were saying you'd probably only buy a copy for an event type mm. thing, um, it is a game that plays really well. Um, like in front of an audience. Um, so the types of things when we do live events and we do a huge code names or we do a huge yeah. werewolf, this would actually be a really good game to take into that. And I've actually, I've got, they've put on a show, the first ever like theatrical version of the, of the game um, a couple of weeks back that I went to. Um, and that's actually where I was speaking to them and that's how this came about. But essentially, um, it was really interesting to to watch as a theatrical show because they had I can't remember how many people I think seven there must have been eight of them actually um, actors who actually did um, perform in certain roles and they sat around in a similar fashion to us in a kind of crescent or half crescent or whatever and um, and then the way they had done it is that um, they could nominate each other to to die obviously and then we as the audience member kind of got to vote mm. um, and that was like actually really interesting to watch I think it, it took about an hour and I do believe they want to do that again in the future and I would highly recommend going to see that because it it was really entertaining and especially because you were involved in some of it it was um, yeah it was really good so I think in that kind of environment it really thrives and it, it does, does really well it almost transcends sort of a standard board game doesn't it it, yes. it feels like something that you like yeah a theater company might buy <laughs> yeah. so that they can do their rendition of, of blood on the clock tower it's it's very strange it's difficult to talk about and this that's why we wanted to sit down and do a first impressions yes hopefully we can get that let's play out as well because it was genuinely the final moments were hilarious yes so it, like we had such a fun time doing it as well um so hopefully that's coming soon yeah but yeah a really really interesting quite novel concept Considering that it came from a game that so many people around the world have played as well, yeah, I think it, it genuinely feels very different. Mm -hmm. And I think that it builds on a lot of the... Because there's so many hidden role games out right now. There is. I think it really builds on the fact that we need to go different. Yes. We need something that hasn't been done before, and it does feel like they, they sort of accomplished that. And I would really love to try some of the other scenarios yes, as Yes, well. me yeah. too. <laughs> <laughs> More players. More games. Um, so yeah, look out for that. Hopefully we'll have the Let's Play rocking around. I really hope we do. Or maybe even next week if we need to be good at it then. But 
yeah, that's Blood on the Clock Tower. Very, very interesting. Five to 20 people. Um, I think they said that a game can take about 90 minutes if you have a big group. Yeah, I think when we were initially talking, um, yeah, bigger. I mean, I played, I played with 12 people in that previous event and it took a little bit over two hours actually, mm. but it came down to the line with that. So I think, yeah. I think it took us about an hour today as well. And I think if you're interested in playing this, bear in mind that, of course, we go to the, the PAX events mm. and there's also things like UK Board Game Expo and all that kind of stuff. Have a look at your local event because they do do sign-ups for do. sessions. So if you're there, if you're coming to, for example, PAX Unplugged mm -hmm. or um, PAX West, and we definitely saw it at PAX West, I know that they had it there. <laughs> if you're going to PAX West, for example, in Seattle, then they had like a sign-up sheet where you could just say, oh, I want to have a game. Yeah. And then you can just sign up your group or, or you can join a group of people yeah. and got one with them. Yeah. yeah, I played at a UK Games Expo for yeah, the exactly. first time and they did it even in the evening after the, the expo was finished. Yeah. So, so if you want to give it a go for yourself, we highly recommend giving it a go. It's fascinating and lots and lots of fun. Uh, so thanks very much for watching. And uh, would you like to sign off? Your first ever <laughs> sign off, please. Uh, thanks very much for watching Dicebreaker. We've got loads of other videos available for you to watch um, if you enjoyed this video. Um, as always, like, share, subscribe, tell everyone about it, all your friends, all your family, all your distant relatives, <laughs> everyone. Um, and as always, hit the bell button if you'd like to get notifications of our future videos. See you next time. Most importantly, have a lovely day. <laughs>